Marketer of the day number 426. Get stuff done, develop your team, get out more, and scale with advertising professional Mike Arce. Hey everyone, and thanks for listening. We're talking right now with Mike Arce, and Mike is the host of the Top Fitness Business Video Podcast, which is called The GSD Show. And he's also the founder and CEO of Loud Rumor, which is a seven-figure advertising agency for small businesses in the fitness and wellness space. And Mike has helped over 25 major brands like Orange Theory Fitness, and his agency has worked with over 457 fitness and wellness companies throughout the world. And as a husband and father of four, Mike has created the time to do all of this while traveling to speak at many events across the country over the last two years. So, Mr. Mike, glad to be talking to you. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. Glad that you're here. So what is on your mind these days? What has you fired up? Well, first, let me just say that the bio, since we sent it to you, which was like two weeks ago, we are actually over 500 clients now, which is pretty cool. Um, But no, I'm excited about the agency. We're getting to work with some amazing brands and uh, franchisees and uh, our team is excited because, you know, they're, they're great customers for us and every day seems to be a very fun day here right now. Awesome. So moving super quick pace, the, the bio is already out of date, all kinds of fun things happening then. Yes, exactly. So do you think that there's something that, that you in particular or that your company does that's unique that kind of gives you more of an advantage over everyone else? No, but a lot of people ask me that. A lot of people say like, what's that one thing? What's the one thing that you do? And tell you the truth, man, you know, I, I, I answered it incorrectly the first few times And I didn't know it was incorrect until people weren't successful with that one thing that I told them to do, which I was telling everybody, you got a niche. You got to pick a focus, which for me, it was fitness. And we just strictly focused on it. However, um, that wasn't the only thing. What I what I realized is before the, the six years prior to that, I was a part of a lot of entrepreneurial programs and um I, re- I really needed to make sure that I knew all the different facets of business. So sales, marketing, um, let you know, uh, uh, leadership, communication, all that stuff. I didn't really, I didn't really like learn that later. I learned that first. The problem was I wasn't able to exercise it because the niching, which allowed me to get in front of a lot of people, um, that that didn't exist. So once I niched. That got my brand in front of a lot of the right people. And then all the things I learned allowed me to scale that. So, you know, hiring people, um, developing people, selling people, retaining people, delivering great results, all those things were able to be exercised. So it's not just one thing. It's really having a great business. And and also, that's why you take people like Shark Tank, all the people, all the, the, the cast on Shark Tank, Marcus Limonis. Those guys are able to jump in businesses and industries that they've never been in, have no experience in. But they're able to be successful because 90% of business is the same. It's just that 10%. So I think a lot of people, they, they look for that 10% when they should be focusing on that 90%. And then that allows them to do more with that 10%. Does that make, does that make sense at all, Robert? Yeah, it does. And, and I, I like that way of thinking a lot. And, and unfortunately, that's, I, I don't know, it seems, it seems like I, I can only speak for myself, but it, it feels like that's that right there is a lesson that I wish I had known years and years ago that that all businesses are kind of the same. And for for and I'm, I'm only kind of starting to get out of it now. But for the longest time, it was like I thought that my business was unique and that I had to be all hands on. and that I couldn't delegate and I couldn't systematize. And that just seemed like a real recipe to be like a, a glorified employee. Like I thought I was going from being an employee to being an entrepreneur. And I made a little bit more money from that. But it felt like I was putting in way more hours. I was doing everything myself. And then all this time was passing and I was only making a little bit of progress. And if only I had looked at, like you said, more like a Shark Tank or more like a Marcus Limonis, like let me be the the chess master, so to speak. And let me see that if this if this is, is missing anything and has these things in place. And that if there is work to be done, how do I do that quickly instead of trying to do it all myself? So I can relate to that in a ton of ways. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I think... I think a lot of businesses fail. In fact, mo- many businesses fail. Um, but I think the reason they fail is because they, you know, the massage therapist, she wants to get, she wants to become the best massage therapist. So she figures if she gets certified in more things than anyone else, 
oh, I do hot stone and I do Asian and I do, you know, all, all these different types of massages. She figures if she gets more certification, she knows more than any other massage therapist, she's going to be the most desired. But there's people out there that know maybe one type of massage, but they really understand how to define what their product is, who their ideal customer is how to get in front of that customer, how to stand out and present what she does better than the competitors, and then how to build systems and processes around scaling and getting more clients than the average massage therapist can handle in the same amount of time frame. That person will be more successful. But you know, the personal trainer wants to get all the certifications. The massage therapist wants to get all that. The, the advertising company wants to learn about all the different things they can do when in reality, those things can't even be exercised if you don't have a business mentality behind it. So why do you think that so many people fall into that trap? Is it just a matter of like going through the day-to-day -day and not having a real plan or not having that outside coach looking in? I mean, why do so many people fall into that trap like you just said where they think they have to learn more or be smarter when maybe they just need to be better business people and market themselves better? I mean, why do people kind of not take that leap they need to make? They just don't know. And yeah, the coaching is a big part of it. So just yesterday, or Saturday, a couple days ago, I was at my son's basketball game and he went through his legs like two or three times and didn't move an inch. And the coach yelled at him and said, Julian, why are you going through your legs so much? You're not even moving forward. You're just in the same spot. And that's what a lot of businesses do. They start doing all these new things, these fancy things, but it doesn't move them forward. So, but, but it's because they don't know. Now, you take people like Tim Duncan, who is a Hall of Famer. The guy, I don't even know if he went through his legs his entire career, 20 years in the NBA. He was Mr. Fundamentals. That was actually his nickname. And so he had the, one of the best coaches of all time in, in uh, Popovich. But, yes, I think a lot of people, you just don't know. If you're ignorant to things, and ignorant isn't a bad word. It's just ignorant means I just don't know. If you're ignorant to it, you don't know. So I think more people need to be reading books like E-Myth and Scaling Up and the Rockefeller Habits and, and just things to understand the principles of biz business. And then whatever they do, it doesn't really matter. They're going to be able to be more successful at that thing. I, I just don't think people even know they should do that or they don't value it. Well, it's great that they're listening to you right now. So now maybe they're kind of waking up a little bit. And so was there was there like a, a, a moment or like some kind of event or something that, that pushed you into this new way of thinking? Like did, did something happen where you had to make a change? I got lucky. Uh, so, no, so I got really, really lucky. I, I became an entrepreneur because of you know, a lot of bad stuff that happened. So I, I hit, like a lot of entrepreneurs, hit a rock bottom point, and then I hit, then I thought that was rock bottom, but then there was more rock bottoms I kept following. So that's why I started a business. But for the first couple of years, I was like everybody else, where I was just wanting to keep develop, de delivering a better product. The product was good already. I just didn't have a business mentality. And then I got real lucky. And I, uh, I went to this one place. I just bumped into the CFO, the former CFO of Cold Stone Creamery. He was there when they had like 40 stores and he was in there until they had over 1,000. And we just hit it off and he said, let's go to lunch. We went to lunch and he asked me what I was reading and I didn't know what he was talking about. And then he started telling me what I'm talking to you guys about. And uh, that opened me up to realize that, you know, it's not just about being a great advertiser. It's about great, being a great business person. And I'm a business owner, advertising the service I deliver, but at the end of the day, I'm a business person at this point. So then he, he made me start reading, and then I got hooked. Every book recommended other books, and so then I started getting coaching because I saw in books that I was reading a lot of the best, most successful people have coaches, and their coaches have coaches. And uh, so you know, I've, I've spent over $150,000 in coaching. I've read over 250 business books. I spend you know a couple couple grand uh every quarter just going to conferences learning more about this stuff i listen to podcasts there's you know every day you have to dedicate to education on business not advertising or, or whatever you do business and then you know um you, you spend a little bit of time developing the product every day as well but business has to be a part of it i like that a lot and just like oh, always being being curious enough to i mean even if there's only time to read a page in the morning i mean imagine what that would add up to or if there's only time to to open up the audible app in your phone and listen to 10 minutes on a run i mean again that adds up to a lot so you 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 lucked out you ran into the uh this guy who was high up in cold stone creamery and he kind of turned you on to you know getting out more and reading and stuff like that so after, I mean, it's one thing to, to hear advice, right? But it's another thing to take action. So do you think that 
there was anything in particular that that kind of motivated you into to doing having those better habits like i mean going out there to conferences and having lunch with people it's a scary thing for a lot of people so how the heck did you do it i i had a son and then i had a daughter that was uh you know just born as well and what i learned was I, so my, my son, who was at that point four years old, five years old, I realized that I never taught him how to walk, but neither did my wife and neither did anybody. Nobody teaches anybody how to walk. Kids just learn how to walk. You encourage them. You put your arms out and you say, you know, come on, you can do it. That's it. You don't say, okay, now the left foot, now the right foot. Even if you did say they wouldn't know what you're talking about. They just walk. And the reason they know how to walk is because they've been watching you do it for the last 10 to 13 months. And people can say, well, it's instinct. Okay, well, then how do you explain that same kid, same age, picking up a toy phone and going, hello, that's not instinct. So they, they watch you and then they do. And you can tell them all this stuff, but they don't do what you tell them. They do what they see you do. And I realize that I can tell my kid what every parent tells their kids, you know, do your best, honey. Just do your best. That's all I care. I don't care if you mess up. Just do your best. It's okay if you mess up. Don't care what anybody thinks. You, you just go out there and do it anyway. It's okay to fail. Failure's part of it, baby. Just do it. They, they, we'd say all this stuff, but how many adults are actually doing it? And so you could tell your kid, do your best, but if you're not doing your best, he's watching that. Or at least that's what he thinks best really is defined as. He can, you can tell him, don't worry if you mess up, but how many times is he watching you mess up and keep moving forward? He can tell you not to care what everybody else thinks, but how many times does he watch you care what everybody else thinks? It doesn't matter what you say, it's what you do. So I realized that if I wanted to really get my son to get the most out of his life, I needed to do whatever I would want him to do. So whatever advice I would tell my son, then I need to follow that myself. I love it. That's that's great. So be a good example. And and I think about I mean, I'm sure you think, too, about your childhood. I mean, I think more about moments of ways my parents acted, especially if like my parents like did something that was kind of kind of like I didn't like, like if they if one of my parents got angry or something, I remember that more compared to what they said. And I mean, I, I don't have kids. I don't know anything about raising kids. But I mean, wait till those kids are teenagers. They're really not going to listen to you. But I'm, they're sure as heck going to going to see what what uh, you're doing there. So so that, that's great. So you kind of like looked for something else outside yourself and, and then looked at, OK, well, it's not just about me. It affects other people if I'm not kind of being my best self and I'm not living this life that I'm supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I didn't even – the thing is you don't think about it until later. So, you know, my – I forgot all about a lot of stuff that went on with my dad. But then later on once it started happening to me and then I, I realized that I behaved a lot like him. So when I was in fourth grade, my dad entered a business deal and he lost everything. He lost his entire life savings he worked so hard for. I, I saw my dad almost have a heart attack while I was in fourth grade. He was in his early 30s. And – so, but then I saw him work 18 hours a day for like the next five to 10 years. I don't know what it was. I just, you know, I'm going by gut feeling, whatever it felt like. But I remember watching the Nick game with him. We were both Nick fans. He and I never missed the Knicks game, never. But my dad worked at home. He was a jeweler. That's what he did. He fixed jewelry, paired jewelry. That's what he did. So he had a bench in the basement and in the other room of that same basement, was the family room where the TV was. So we would be watching the Nick game, and my job was to tell him every time the game was about to start. Because whenever there was a timeout, my dad would run to the other side of the basement, and he'd do whatever work he could do in two minutes. And then once the game was on, I would go, Dad, it's on. And he'd run back, and he'd sit next to me and watch a game together. And then at halftime, he'd get a good 15, 20 minutes to work. And that's what he did. That's how much he worked. There was not one minute wasted, but... He still spent time with me. And so I have four kids. I've coached 13 seasons of basketball. I've coached two seasons of baseball, two seasons of football, two seasons of soccer. I go to all the practices. I go to all pretty much all the games. I've missed maybe six out of like 280 or whatever it is. And so I go to all this stuff no matter what. But at the same time, you know, GSD, that's the name of the show. It stands for Get Shit Done. I'm still moving forward and working my ass off to make sure that, the company and everything that we're doing here is working together, but the two are married together, you know, the, the family time, the business. And I didn't realize until I hit rock bottom, until I started working that way naturally, no one taught me to work that way verbally. No one said, Mike, you hit rock bottom. Here's what you got to do. You got to work 18 hours a day, but somehow you got to find time for the family. No one verbally told me that. I just did it. 
And then I went back later on after I got myself out of the hole and realized that's what my dad did. And I could only, I could only put my finger on the fact that I just, I, I absorbed that, you know? Yeah, that's, that's great. You, you absorbed it as a kid and it kind of stuck in there for when you needed it later on. And so, and you mentioned your, your GSD show and your agency. And so can you kind of go into a little bit of detail about what your agency is exactly and what the GSD show is and, and like all the cool stuff you do? Yeah, so our agency helps fitness studios and independent gyms um, with their advertising. We get more leads for these people than anybody else, period. Like we are it right now. Um, and we do it through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and that's what we do. Um, the GSD show is a video podcast that we created for them. It's really cool. It's got like a sports center theme and everything that helps people in that industry succeed. So we bring in a lot of influencers and they share their business knowledge, not just fitness knowledge, but business knowledge on how they can uh, better grow their business. Now, since then, that show is actually going to be going on a hiatus as I was asked to be the host of a show for a huge organization called Mind Body, And uh, so it's, it's duplicate content. It doesn't need to happen. So I'm actually, now it's going to be the bold show. But I started a new show, Robert, and it's called The Goat Show. Do you know what GOAT stands for? No idea. No. So if I tell you Michael Jordan's a GOAT, Tom Brady's a GOAT, Muhammad Ali's the GOAT, you still don't know what it stands for if the first word is greatest? Uh, gr- greatest of a time, maybe? Of all time. Ah, perfect. All time. So basically every episode, I interview somebody that's arguably the greatest of all time in whatever it is they do. So we are we are uh, launching it in January. We're interviewing 15 people before the end of the year, so we're going to have 15 episode head start. We've already uh, interviewed John Lee Dumas, Dennis Yu, Ryan Dice. I'm flying out to interview Lewis Howes on Friday. Damon John's coming on, Russell Brunson, Grant Cardone. All these guys are coming on arguable goats and what they do. And and the reason is because what I told you, I get to sit down with these guys for, you know, whatever time I'm, I'm asking them questions and I get to ask them whatever I want and learn from them, develop relationships with them. And to me, that's been the most valuable part of my business is not learning how to run an ad to get myself more customers. It's learning how to look at everything, the big picture, because I'm hanging out and learning from people that are far more successful for longer than I am, you know, and they've been doing it for longer. And sometimes, even if you're more successful than people in, in general, they may be better than you at one thing. So you take like that average five-year-old kid that can destroy you in a video game. It's not that he's smarter than you. It's just that he's played it a thousand times. So he already knows what's going to happen, where the guy's going to come from, where the bullet's going to come from. So he already knows because he's memorized things and he can predict, whereas you are reacting to like what's coming at you. So I like to just learn from people and the goat show allows me to learn from the best. I love it. And, and I can relate to something similar with, you know, interviewing all these different people on the podcast, like some some little lesson stuck. And then sometimes if I just keep hearing the same lesson over and over from like 10, 20 different guests, I think, OK, well, all these people who have these like deep skills in other areas, if they all have this kind of common ground, then that's something that I really need to, to listen to. And so I'm curious, like, how do you reconcile the sort of uh, the, I guess, like grinding it out versus the more, the more like intangible stuff, because like on one hand, like, you know, networking and getting yourself out there and all that's really important. But then there's also the time to kind of be back in the office and do the things that need work. And and you can't have one without the other. And if you have too much without the other, like there's problems there, but how, how do you, how do you view that? How do you know if you're spending too much time in the office with just your team or too much time networking? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it depends on where you're at in your business. So if you're just starting right now, then you have to, you're building everything. So you've got to be in the office because you're, you're, you're doing the sales, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the customer service, you're creating the processes and systems as if you have employees so that when you do have employees, those things are already, you know, set up and ready to go and be trained on. So, um, but you still got to make time to learn every day. But eventually as you start developing your team, which should be a goal for you, um, is to be able to hire people that can start taking these hats off for you, then the majority of your time should be spent on that. Right right now, I probably spend a total of five to ten hours a week in the office, and majority of it's really just developing the people here and spending time with them and listening to their ideas, um, you know, optimizing some of the strategies we have in place and, and just making sure everyone's got a really good place to, to work. And that's all I really do. Outside of that, the majority of my time is 
education, you know, reading a lot, listening to other podcasts, um, interviewing other people, get, and, then, and then keeping those relationships so I can find ways to continue meeting up with them even after the podcast is over. So I think that should be a goal. But uh, it's like kids, you know, when you first when you first have a kid, all your time is devoted to that kid because the kid can't do anything without you. The kid can't sit. The kid can't feed itself. The kid can't change its own diaper. But then over time, then you could start focusing on other things because the kid becomes more it, it, it can start running himself, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. So so basically like and, and it kind of any situation when it's first going and you're trying to, you know, work the bugs out of whatever system you're building and maybe you're doing some of it yourself, it's like you're doing maybe more work than, than you can sustain, more work than you think you had to. But then if you, now that you're getting the kinks out, now that you're making the system yourself, then you know that at some point you can hand it off to someone else or refine your system better or do it easier. So it's kind of like, you know, like if you're, if you're pedaling a bike at first, like you have to work a lot, but once you get up to a certain speed, it's pretty easy to maintain that speed. Right. And then developing people is extremely important. So like, you know, say you take your kids, you can either be that kid that has to help your kid with home or that parent. You, you could either be that parent that helps your kid with homework until he's in high school, or you could be that parent that really teaches your kid how to get ahead of the game early so that he's ahead without you even having to help him. So then little by little, that means instead of you being involved in the homework stuff until high school, you don't have to be. You can get out of that earlier, and that allows you to work on other things with him, which means you're able to develop him faster. You can keep doing the same thing. Same thing with your people. You could be the person that's micromanaging all your people and making sure they are running ads the way you tell them to do it, or you could be teaching them where they can continuously learn how to run this, basically where you would go to learn, teach them where to go, and then teach them the value of learning it so that they can start doing that on their own, and they're creating without you having to be there. Right. So that so that way you can keep on ramping up. And it's like if you're micromanaging too much, it's almost like if you raise a kid to be too sheltered, then you're you're hurting them by doing more work for them. It's better if you can get them to, to learn this and do it themselves. If you're always micromanaging your kid, you never have time to spend. You never have time with your wife. Right. Because because you're constantly chasing the kid around. Next, you know, it's 10 o'clock and you're both like, I'm going to kill that kid. And you just can't wait to go to bed versus. You know, kid does his homework on his own. While he's doing his homework, you and your wife can have like a conversation. <laughs> so right. have 30 seconds to yourselves, right? Yeah. And you, or you could work on yourself, which helps you work on the household, you know, just in general. So how, work on the things in the house, you know, things that you have to do, your, your own financials. So you, the, the more you can get the people in your tribe to be self-sufficient and, and be self-thriving, um, the easier it is for you to work on the things that allows that tribe to grow. So did you experience any sort of those hiccups when it, when it came to growing your tribe, when it came to getting these clients or building your team, anything that you wish you'd known going in? I wish I knew everything I knew now going in. There's not one thing, uh, but you can't learn it all at once. So I would say, you know, if you just start now and you haven't read, read the book E-Myth Revisited First by Michael Gerber, because that really just helps you understand what your small business owners need to understand. And then outside of that, I mean, just, just read like t books like Tools of Titans to find out what the highest performers are doing and how they're doing it. I mean, you, you want to be great. You, you want to study great people. That's as simple as that. You, know, you, you want to learn how to, how to do anything. You want to you study from people that are already doing that thing better. And I think a lot of people just work hard on trying to figure it out themselves and they waste a ton of time and, and it's draining on not just on you, but on your family because they have to wait longer for you to figure it out too. Right. I mean, time you'll never get back. And then the other downside to that, and I mean, I think, you know, I can relate to this and a lot of other people can, I think too, is like, if, if you make things too hard on yourself, then you kind of have that, that limiting belief in your head that like, oh yeah, building a business was real hard. Well, yeah, because you made it way too hard on yourself than it had to be or making a website or you know, building a business, all that stuff. And it's like maybe that, that act itself of building a business doesn't have to be hard, but maybe the way that you yourself did it is hard. And I ha haven't read Tools of Titans yet, but E-Myth, that's like one of those books. Like, I mean, I completely agree with you. I can't recommend that one enough. I think I, I read it five years ago, only read it once, so I should probably read it again, but I read it five years ago and I still think about that. Like, 
a couple of times a week. And I was even thinking about this morning, like I, I love that one. And that just really helped to get out of my headspace and that, oh yeah, this whole time I thought that like I was, I was the boss. Well, no, it seemed at this whole time I was my own worker. And what I need to do is hire workers. And then if that becomes too much, then have the managers take care of the workers and kind of build this beast. So that way, that way it can kind of multiply time and get everyone else to doing all these things that uh, I wasn't able to do myself. So kind of a, a hard lesson to learn and you kind of have to get over, over the ego a little bit and let go a little bit and take a little bit of those risks. But I mean, great reminders and I definitely need to, uh, to hop on Tools of Titans. Is there any like one kind of tip in particular from, that, from Tools of Titans that stands out to you so that I have like a motivation to, to get into that book? No, there's no one tip because it's going to, there's every two pages is like another person. There's hundreds of people that this guy interviewed. So the thing is you got to find what works well for you. Um, but for, for the audience, I want to actually summarize the most valuable thing in, in E-Myth because I think if you can just think about this at all times, you're solid. You want to build your business like you're going to sell it. Whether you're going to sell it or not, you want to build it like you're going to sell it. So have you ever sold a house? When you're about to sell your house, the very first thing you do before you list it is you fix it. You go and, and if the sink's not working, you pay to get it fixed. If the yard looks like crap, you go fix the yard. If the tiles got dirty grout, you clean the grout. Like the, you fix up the paint. You do all these things. You, you invest maybe five to ten grand into the house knowing that that will allow the perceived value to go up maybe 40 to 50 grand and also move the sale faster. You do that for that reason. Now, the cool thing is we did that, and as soon as we spent, it was like 6500 bucks. we spent it, we fixed the house up, we looked at the house, we were excited to sell, and now we go, man, I kind of like this place now. I don't want to leave. you know. And I think when you're building your business, you should always build it as if, and constantly do things as if you're going to sell it. So the girl, that the massage therapist that wants to get all those certifications, that's great. Well, if you're selling the business and you don't come along with it, it doesn't matter how many certifications you have. No one wants your business right. because it depends on you. That personal trainer's got all these certificates. That's awesome. But if you're selling it and you're leaving, well, then what's the guy going to do with your business? It means nothing without you. So you want to build your business as if you're going to sell it to someone else and you're not going to be a part of it. And it's got to be just as valuable without you. And if you can do that, two great things. One, if you want to sell it, it's got more value. Two, if you don't want to sell it, it's yours. How awesome is that? <laughs> so it's, that's the best thing I got from e -Myth, and that's the way I look at the business at all times. I love it. So so it's it's win-win. If you want to stay in or you want to sell it, either way you win as long as you do these right things and you do these right steps. And so, I mean, so great stuff. So how can people find the GSD show and how can people find Loud Rumor along with anything else you got going on? So for me, you can go to MikeRC.live. That's M-I-K-E, Mike, and then A-R-C-E, R-C, dot live. Um, the GSD show.com will take you to the podcast for the GSD show. Loudrumor.com, loud rumor, and we'll, uh, that, that'll take you to our agency site. Super great. So three easy things to remember, MikeRC.live, thegsdshow.com, and then loudrumor.com if you want to check out the agency. So thanks so much, Mr. Mike, for stopping by and having that blend of of really good advice and really great stories and really great examples and for kind of reminding us that you know it's not all about one thing and I mean like it's really tempting to to say like out of all the things like here's the one thing that made all the difference but like you said you got to always be curious always be kind of moving in that next direction always be uh, talking to people you need to talk to reading what you need to read so if we were just to say like it's just one thing well then that would kind of cheat teat everyone else because it's like, well, here's like maybe number one on the priority list, but now we're missing out on items two through 20. So, so great stuff. And also that, also that reminder that everyone is unique. Everyone's on our own path. So again, if we were to kind of overgeneralize and say, well, this one thing everyone, uh, everyone needs to take away from, well, every, all of us are on our own journey. All of us are at different uh, parts in our business, depending on what we want. So great reminders all across the board and a best of luck to you in building your, your uh, agency to maybe to, to a thousand clients or 5,000 clients, wherever it ends up at. I uh, can't wait to see what you end up creating. And thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks a lot, Robert. I appreciate it. Go right now to marketeroftheday.com slash iTunes to subscribe to the show, listen to other episodes, and rate and review the show.